three, two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Dr. Jeff Standridge, calling in from Central Arkansas, if I recall correctly. Jeff, how are we doing? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm I'm excited about this one because uh, you are you are wearing a lot of different hats. Uh, you uh you have multiple hats, different and like different things you're into. Uh, also, an educator teaching at the College of Business and University of Central Arkansas. So we're going to get into all that. But first, Jeff, go ahead and introduce yourself. Who is Jeff? Sure. Who is Jeff? So uh, I'm an Ar- uh, I'm a Texan by birth and an Arkansan by choice. Uh, pretty much have grown up in Arkansas my entire life. Uh, spent about nine years, actually more uh, about 10 or 11 years in healthcare. Uh, was a professor at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences, was a paramedic respiratory therapist on the helicopter team at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Decided while I was a professor, I didn't want to do another clinical degree. So I, I got a degree in, in organizational behavior. And that led me into the corporate world. Spent about 20 years with a publicly traded technology company did mergers and acquisitions and global operations uh, pretty much all over the world. And about eight years ago, I started an entrepreneurial support organization called The Conductor. Uh, Well, I'm sure we'll dig into that. So I I, uh, work with a team of folks. The Conductor Startup Junkie is the the organization uh, that focuses on uh, driving entrepreneurship and innovation in the state of Arkansas. And then in 2020, we started a company called uh, Innovation Junkie to focus on companies that didn't really qualify for the sponsored or funded services, uh, and it's more of a billable consulting firm, and uh, get to do some investing as well through our venture fund called Cadron Capital Partners. So you're right, a lot of, lot of hats, but uh, I enjoy wearing everyone of hats, them. indeed. My goodness, you, you've you been doing quite a bit of work, uh, and I love it because a lot of the work that you're doing is actually to support their community growth and right economic development right. there locally. Uh, and, and, you know, me and Jeff were kind of talking about this earlier about the creation of this podcast. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they, they're constantly saying that the economy is built on the back of small businesses and, and it's true. And, and that making sure they have the support that Jeff is able to provide is, is very cool. Now let's, let's get into this, uh, this current um, venture of yours. You mentioned mm-hmm. that the conductor, tell us a little bit about it. What is it? How'd you start it? Yeah, so uh, uh, 2013, I was chair of our local chamber of commerce. So I live in a town called Conway, Arkansas. It's outside of Little Rock, our capital city, by about 30 miles, about 70,000 population, uh, uh, three institutions of higher education, a state university, a liberal arts college, and a a Bible school, Um, and uh, a very educated workforce, uh, young educated workforce. Uh, at that time, we had two very large technology employers, one with about 2,500 employees in the in the community and one with about 1,500. And, and so I, I, as chair of the chamber, put together a working group to explore why don't we have more startup activity going on and what do we need to do to try to cultivate entrepreneurship more in our community. And that led to a relationship with Startup Junkie Consulting up in Northwest Arkansas. They had been doing my business partner up there, Jeff Amaran, another Jeff had been doing this work about seven or eight years at that time. This By, this, by now, we're in 2016. And uh, through a partnership with Startup Junkie and the University of Central Arkansas and ultimately the U.S. Small Business Administration and the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, uh, we now have um, uh, Conductor Startup Junkie is basically the statewide technology commercialization center for the for the state of Arkansas. And we have a couple of uh, regional innovation clusters that were funded through the U.S. Small Business Administration for. And uh, that's what we do. So we do free coaching, consulting, uh, mentoring, training, access to capital, culture building, entrepreneurial culture building uh, around the state. And all of those services in the state of Arkansas are, are what we call sponsored or they're funded by third party funding sources. That is that is really cool. That is that is very interesting the way you've kind of integrated, um, you know, a lot of the community with what you're trying to do, and really kind of focusing on, you know, what what is actually going to continue to uh, thrive and scale, which is really awesome. And then I, I like the way you you created additional program off of that to really focus on individuals that might not be at that that business scalable level, but they're still interested. in, in you know, if they're uh, here's some education and some consulting. Yeah. You know, we don't turn anybody away. 
So um, we, we, everyone who comes to us, they, our, our calendars are open. They book time on our calendars. And, and once we have that initial intake meeting, uh, we follow them through a, a CRM, so to speak, and, and we refer them within the network. We have a, a vast network of subject matter experts that just donate their time. And we, we, we meet them where they are. It could be they just have an idea. Uh, it could be that they have a piece of software. Uh, spoke with a lady today who has, uh, she moved here from another geography where she had a fairly successful uh, bakery and lunch business. And so I met with her and got her plugged into the right people in the community to figure out where she could rent space. She has all the equipment. She just needs to set up shop again. Uh, but, you know, ultimately we want to increase the proportion of, of activity that is around scalable tech or tech enabled businesses that ultimately will create high wage jobs in our, in our state. But we don't start, we don't turn anybody away. Um, about two years ago, our local in, in Conway, our local public utility called Conway Corporation. So they provide water, sewer, garbage, cable TV, electric, internet, et, et cetera. They acquired the old city hall about 100 yards up the street here, a, a, almost a 12,000 square foot building, renovated the building to our specification and said, we want to provide this to you. We, we'll, we'll, we'll still own the building, but we want to gift the use of it to you guys to basically run your innovation center out of there. So we have about 150 members in a co-working space, uh, about another dozen or so that lease space, uh, a small pods of offices upstairs. We run all of our programming out of there. and uh, But you don't have to be a member of the Arnold Innovation Center to um, to take advantage of the services of the conductor or startup junkie. Oh, that's great. That's great. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned, too, was uh, partnerships, connecting individuals with, you know, like-minded people. Let, talk a little bit about the importance of mentorship in, in being successful in an entrepreneur endeavor. You know, I've said before, and I think that's a great question, Gabriel. I, you know, I, I've said before that organizations that try to force feed mentorship into their organization by by pairing people or you know very inorganically with other people and and it just doesn't work it doesn't work we would be yep. money ahead as a country as an education system and as an entrepreneurial system to spend more time teaching people how to seek find and utilize mentors versus teaching someone how to be a mentor and how to how to uh, inorganically pair them up with somebody else. Um, you know, the moment we say, you know, I've had hundreds of, of mentors in my life, and I don't think any of them ever involved a conversation where I asked, will you be my mentor? You know, uh, because the moment I ask that question, it takes the responsibility off of me and it puts it on you as the as the Sherpa, the guide, the guru or whatever. And so I think the the best way, and, and by the way, it is vitally important. Uh, the best way is to teach people how to use mentors, find out the areas where they know that they're weak, find people who who appear to be strong in those areas and say, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? I'd just love to pick your brain for 30 minutes. Can I buy you lunch? Can I can can I just drop by your office? Would you drop by my office? Whatever. And and let's just have a conversation. That's the best way. And and you know, when we when we first started doing the research to find out what is it that entrepreneurs need to be successful, what do startup founders need to be successful? Uh, in order, they need access to expertise in the form of mentors, coaches, consultants, uh, subject matter experts, et cetera. They need access to each other uh, so that they can share ideas, share resources, and they need a culture that makes that natural and organic, the the creative collisions of meeting entrepreneurs and finding out what we have in common and then organically growing a relationship where we can share ideas and resources. And then third, they need access to capital at all stages of venture development and growth. And so we tackle all three of those. You know, I, I really like that because again, you're you know, growth and, and scalability within an entrepreneurship program is is very difficult because, you know, you're wearing so many hats as the founder and there's so many different either operational or financial or strategic. There's so many different things that that could go wrong during that piece. And so having someone that has gone down that path um, that understands 
operations that understands marketing that under whatever that subject matter expert is, you know, as Jeff was alluding to whatever, whoever that is, it, it's really important to kind of connect with them. You know, Jeff, one of the things uh, because of this podcast, I uh, was able to start a nonprofit Latino founders. It's a 501 C three business accelerator program, similar to what you're doing out there. Except we're business agnostic uh, in our accelerator program. And the reason for that is because we do want that organic conversation between our entrepreneurs uh, to say, Hey, everybody has operational issues. These are mine. Here are yours. Um, you know, the same, same thing with marketing. Hey, this is my marketing. This is my staffing issues. Hey, Black Friday and Cyber Monday are coming up. How do you, how do you do that? How do you market it? How do you sell it? How do you make sure what are ca customer acquisition costs? You know, all of these little things that go into uh, building and scaling a business. Uh, and one of the things, if you're not doing this yet, uh, pitch competitions, you know, leveraging oh, yeah. pitch competitions, you know, those those also, it's so cool because it provides an opportunity for these entrepreneurs to get out and try to sell their business. Uh, that's what you're going to have to do, whether you're going to trade shows, whether you're going to a venture capitalist or a bank, that's right. uh, you're going to have to sell that story. Um, and yeah, we do. those things is, is really important. Yeah, we do an idea, what we call an idea fame live. And it's a, a 60 second pitch competition. No notes, no slides, no props. Uh, we give away, uh, we do it a couple of three times a year. Um, and, um, you know, you, you can sign up to pitch or at the end, we can have people come from the floor and decide to pitch if they build up the courage, maybe they oh, didn't have the cool. courage to sign up, but they build up the courage during the pitch competition. We have three judges and, and we, we, we give a thousand dollars away to the judge's choice. And then we give a thousand dollars away to the people's choice. Uh, the young, um, uh, the, the people that are in the audience. And we had a young lady who was 11 Actually, I think she was 10 when she actually pitched at our competition. And uh, she had gone around to the to five different pitch competitions and had won either the judge's choice or the people's choice at every one. And so she she had uh, she was creating a product that she was sourcing out of China. And it was a, a set of leggings that had a pocket on the inside of the like leggings that get worn with knee boots. And oh, there yeah. was a okay, pocket inside the knee boot so that they could put their driver's license, their lipstick, their money or whatever. And she she designed them herself. Her company was called uh, Wise Pocket Products, and uh, she won five thousand dollars from five different pitch competitions. Uh, made her first order. When she was fourteen, she went on Shark Tank, and uh, actually got a deal with Damon Johns, and actually negotiated a better deal than what he originally offered at fourteen. Uh, and uh, and so that was kind of a highlight, one of the highlights. But but yeah, we don't turn anyone away. Even though we want to ultimately have a higher proportion of of scalable tech tech enabled knowledge based high wage you know industries, um, we don't turn anyone away. And I will tell you some of the greatest ahas I have seen have been when a Main Street business owner sitting in a peer group discussion asked a software CEO, "Why are you doing that?" And the software CEO went, "Great question. I don't know." <laughs> And, uh, and so you have those kinds of things, you know, everyone can help everyone, no matter what your business is, when you're coming together and you have the culture where you can ask tough questions, yep. give guidance and feedback and build relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. And, you know, there's, yeah, I tell this to people all the time. There's a lot of things I know, I know there's things I know, I don't know, but it's the things that I don't know that I don't yep. know is where you really need help. In. And that's, that's kind of exactly what you mentioned. Now, Jeff, I got I got I got to take a step back cuz you know, one of the things you mentioned you you were doing all this business but you said you've been in healthcare for 12 years previous to this you know you did a a stent as a, a, a emergency medical uh, a, a far, a pharmacist or what was that? I think it was a respiratory therapist paramedic respiratory therapist let's try to remember what it was uh, yep. but yeah, take me take me back how did how did the transition from healthcare to what you're doing now T talk about uh, that kind of what you're doing previous to entrepreneurship and how that transition occurred you know, it it when you look at it or read it in a bio or see it on a resume, it looks like it was a revolution, but it was really more of an evolution. So I've always been entrepreneurial. I started mowing yards when I was in the third grade. By the time I was in the sixth grade, I was literally running a gas station on Saturdays and making extra money fixing flats and and detailing automobiles. And Love by it. the time I, I was a, a ninth <laughs> grader, I could I could. I worked at a muffler shop where I could cut the exhaust system off of an automobile and weld it all the way back. Um, I actually uh, worked my way through college uh, as a as an EMT, so I crammed 
the four year degree into six years because I had to work full time, first generation college student. My and uh, and then went on the heli- went on to respiratory therapy school, helicopter team at Arkansas Children's Hospital. But the day I, the, the week after I graduated, I actually bought the gas station and muffler shop that I had worked at all through high school. And I hired a guy to run it for me, thinking that I was going to, you know, have a passive income business there and ended up losing it. And so at the age of 24, lost my first business, newly married and and uh, got some of my very first critical business lessons. Um, while I was teaching at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences in the respiratory therapy program, I decided I wanted a degree, a doctorate in something other than clinical science. So I chose more organizational behavior, organizational psychology. And I was studying the differences of top performers versus average performers. That was kind of my dissertation research. Oh, interesting. What is it that differentiates top 1% of performers from the middle 50%? Because the middle 50% aren't unsuccessful. They're still successful. In fact, the, the world runs on the middle 50%, right? Very good. But point. I wanted to see, I wanted to see what the difference was. And so I was researching that a publicly traded company through a conversation with a guy at church, found out about that research, wanted to replicate that research inside their company with database administrators, software engineers. And so went to work for them. And then we acquired a large, uh, two large companies in uh, with, with locations in uh, seven countries in Europe. And they sent me over there to do the acquisition due diligence and integration. And so I got my business education as an entrepreneur doing entrepreneurial things within the safety net of a corporate salary. And so um, I started a company in Poland for that for that publicly traded company and scaled it to 350 people. Same thing in China, uh, acquired and managed one in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Dubai then in Brazil. And uh, the last uh, four or five years I was there, I ran a North American sales team, basically taking their Fortune 1000 level products and services down to the mid market. And so just have always been in love with entrepreneurship, small, medium business. And um, that's, that's kind of how it evolved over the years. You know, I, I love that you said that the entrepreneurship piece, because I think uh, there's a this big misconception uh, that individuals that work in a corporate setting or work in some type of, you know, even a nonprofit setting don't have that entrepreneurial uh, experience. Uh, but Truly, th- those organizations do give you, you know, I'm in business development, so I'm definitely exposed to a lot of different, uh, you know, strategy and marketing tactics, um, you know, and then again, scaling the nonprofit. So that's another piece, you know, just hired an executive director, figuring out taxes, figuring out employment things. Uh, these are all things you continue to learn. And, you know, you mentioned your gas station, um, you know, it failing when you're at a young age, but at the same time, the the cost that you probably would have spent on an education to learn what you learned during that time probably supersedes oh, yeah. the amount that you may have lost. Because, you know, at the end of the day, guys, sometimes failing is actually a good thing because it teaches you a lot. You know, like I always say, I've never failed a day in my life. I either succeed or I learn. Those are the those are the two options, right? Because failure to me means I'm I'm done. I'm never going to try it again. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done, right? Uh, but you learn something and you continue to move forward. How did you move forward, you know, from the gas station? How did you, how did you transition from being an entrepreneur to, an, you know, an actual entrepreneur to an yep. entrepreneur? Well, so first of all, I, one of my sayings is failure is only failure if you quit. Otherwise, it's just feedback. And if you take that feedback and adapt your style, adapt your approach, adapt your direction, then, you know, you may, you may have another temporary setback and then you adapt and you get better and you refine, et cetera. So, I mean, I, at, at 24 years of age, newly married, uh, you know, my wife and I were probably making a sum total of $50,000 a year. And uh, I had to walk into the bank of, of uh, a local community bank of a uh, gentleman who was actually a distant family member of mine and say, Charles, I've, I've liquidated all the assets of the company and I can't pay you the full balance of what I owe you. And he said, well, how much can you pay a month? And I said, well, I think I could, I just got married and, you know, I, we're going to start a family before long. I hope, you know, I, I think I could probably pay $150 a month. And he said, I tell you what, I'll go get you a payment book. <laughs> so he got me a payment book, uh, that, uh, that, that I spent the next 10 or 12 years paying that note off. Right. Wow. And, um, and so I called it my, my tuition to character school. And yeah. uh, so, so I stayed out of the entrepreneurial realm for a, for a few years. I, um, I, I then got into um, some real estate investing. 
So I had read every book on the market out there about uh, the no money down real estate uh, and and uh, actually started uh, applying some of those techniques. And I had a first cousin who was my my age. We were five weeks apart, moved to the same area that I was in. He was actually in the construction industry. And so we started together uh, buying rental properties and um, with with very little to no money down and financing those and fixing them up and renting them. And then we got into building a few homes and then he started a, a high-end cabinet shop. And, and uh, then uh, I started uh, a venture fund and started investing. And, and while I was doing all the work at Axiom there with the, the entrepreneurial work. And uh, finally on my 50th birthday, eight years ago, almost eight years ago, I, I actually made the decision a few months before and orchestrated my exit to, to retire from my corporate employment to start my own consulting firm. And um, that's what uh, ultimately led to the conductor startup junkie uh, relationship and now innovation junkie and, and what have you. And so, it, like I said, it, it, it's much more of an evolution over time than it was a revolution, but uh, I, I've Never expected to be 58 years old and working as hard as I'm working right now, but I'm having an absolute blast. Yeah, you know, and that's I love that story because uh, one of the things that was interesting piece that you're kind of talking about your research, uh, I would love to take it back to your research. Sure. Uh, what what were your findings? You, you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, trying to identify the difference between a high performer, uh, one of the one percenter versus that 50 percenter. What yep. were your findings? So my findings were were similar to some other findings that have that have been out there in the past, and and the way I boil it down, and the way I've boiled it down for years. Number one, academic credentials, academic attainment, professional credentials, letters behind one's name have absolutely nothing to do with someone's success in the real world. Just that like very true, the ACT and the SAT scores do not predict college success college success does not predict real world success. And uh, it really boils down to how people behave and the degree to which they cultivate a set of knowledge, skills, and, and abilities and habits that they can transform into habits and behaviors. And those behaviors really fall into two realms. Uh, and I, I think about a set of scales, kind of like the, the balance of scales. And on one side are results, and on the other side are relationships. So the behaviors and habits, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that lead me and, and, and enable me to develop behaviors and habits around the delivery of results and the knowledge, skills, and abilities that, that uh, enable me to develop the behaviors and habits around the creation and the maintenance of long-term relationships. If I focus on results at the expense of relationships, I will get wild, I'll get wild success very, very quickly usually, until I alienate everyone around me who's responsible for helping me maintain those results, and then I ultimately lose them both. But by the same token, if I focus on relationships at the expense of results, people will love me, they will enjoy working with me and hanging around me until they can no longer respect me because I can't deliver results or I can't do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. And so it really takes this tightrope of uh, behaviors and habits that enable me to deliver results and that enabled me to build and maintain strong relationships. You know, I think that's a great point. Uh, one of the things, you know, behaviors and habits is very, very important, folks. Uh, you know, one of the things I've talked about in a former episode was making my bed every day. This is some. This is something I recently started doing a couple of years ago. But I heard that I, I read recently. You know. Uh, to your point, um, you know, a lot of successful people, what they do is they have a very stringent you know, kind of habit or schedule. And one of those things is, you know, waking up and making their bed every day, because then they feel like, yep. okay, that's one thing I've accomplished. And, and it's something you do first thing in the morning. And so I've been doing that. And that has now translated to, okay, now I'm eating eggs and a banana every morning. Okay, now I'm getting on the Peloton uh, pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm like, all of these things are starting to become, you know, habits, because, uh, of just feeling this like accomplishment first thing in this morning, right? Doing the That's bed. Right. Okay, now right. now we can kind of move forward. Now with those habits, what are what are ways have like for listeners that are listening? What are things they can begin to do to start thinking or you know start to progressing and creating these habits so they become more successful? Yep. Well, I, you know I'm a big proponent of stepping back and developing self awareness, and and I often start 
by uh, or, and suggest people start by listing the things that they know that they're naturally strong at. I am good at, um, and I am not so good at, right? And and creating that, curating that list, so to speak. But then going and asking for feedback from spouses or significant others, from uh, adult children, uh, colleagues, friends, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and using that to validate or invalidate their own assumptions in that regard. And then I like to have them actually uh, uh, separate those strengths and weaknesses, so to speak, into uh, results-oriented strengths, strengths and weaknesses and relationship-oriented strengths and weaknesses. For instance, you know, one of my weaknesses is I'm just not very empathetic. And when I was working on my doctorate, I told my wife that um, I was only going to be about nine hours away from, from being qualified to sit for the licensed professional counselor exam. And I thought I was going to go ahead and just take those hours. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? I, I think I would be a good counselor. She said, you would be a horrible counselor. You would, you would, you would be in the third meeting with someone repeating the same issue that they're having and saying, when are you going to do something different? You know? so, and so sometimes it takes, you know, asking for that feedback or, or having someone close to you who doesn't wait for you to ask for that feedback, to give you that feedback and look at the themes in your life and, and really begin to look at where you're strong, where you're weak. You know, I do believe in the basis of the strengths finder movement. Um, but what I don't believe in and what I don't agree with is the degree to which a lot of people went and read the book and, and, or got certified and, and became strengths finder gurus. And then all of a sudden started running around telling everyone to not focus on their weaknesses. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is we have to focus on both. Uh, yeah, maybe we need to put more of a focus on our strengths and, and, and leverage ourselves where we are best at it, but, but there can be some very career and success limiting blind spots that if we don't work on those as well, we will not be as successful as we could have been. So, yeah, it kind of goes back to your whole point results versus, uh, relationships, right. Having it on that pendulum and making sure that it's a good balance of, you know, focusing on your strengths and your weaknesses, because at the end of the day, if you're not getting comparatively better, you're getting competitively worse. Right. So, so making sure you're focusing on those weaknesses. Now, now, Jeff, one of the things that was interesting is, is, you know, you mentioned your, you're kind of in uh, you know, the the healthcare space, and then you kind of go into a bit of a research kind of space, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then you start a coaching consulting business. How did you build that brand into what it is today? Well, so um, I first of all started doing quite a lot of uh, speaking and and consulting when I was still employed on leadership. And I mean, leadership was kind of my my research interest and my my uh, professional interest. And so I was doing quite a bit of that around the state and doing some strategic planning for nonprofits and what have you. And so I, I started building a little bit of a brand uh, identity around it, doing some writing uh, in the local business publications and what have you. And then when we launched the conductor, you know, I fortunately was able to piggyback a little bit on the brand of, of startup junkie who had been at it for about six or seven years. And, um, and, and, you know, because we were doing something that was, really unexpected here in Conway, a town of 70,000 people that got some attention as well. And so then just, you know, I, I, I told people when I retired from my employment at 50 years of age that I'd spent the first half of my life making a living. I wanted to spend the second half making a difference. And so, uh, you know, I, w you know, I hired great people around me and we've got a great team of folks and we hire for our core values, uh, and our core values are around making a difference, doing the right thing, uh, going the extra mile, never trading results for excuses, having fun, taking care of each other. And, and so that also includes not turning anyone away who needs help. So we will sit down with anyone who comes to the table and says, we, you know, I, I need to pick your brain about something. And so we give, we give and we give, we give a lot. Um, and, uh, and I think that's probably contributed to as much of the brand as anything, to be honest. You know, one of the things you've, you've done too, is you, you know, you mentioned you're coaching a bunch of entrepreneurs, you're working with different businesses. 
What would you say you've noticed is one of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make? The biggest mistake, and, and this is not original the, to my finding, it's been reported by other um, uh, thought leaders, is they create a product or a service that no one wants. Or better probably defined, they create a product or a service that not enough people will buy at the price point required for it to be a profitable ongoing concern. That's kind of number one. Very close to that is thinking even for a moment that anyone and everyone is their potential customer. Um, and so, you know, understanding, you know, we need to fall in love with the problem we're solving and we need to solve that problem in a way that can be profitable. And we need to figure out who are the niche of people that experience that problem to the greatest degree uh, that would benefit the most from a solution and then target everything we do and say toward those people or we'll run out of money trying to market to everyone before enough people will buy our product or service to be to be profitable. And so those two things together are are kind of the teeter-totter or the uh, the the seesaw, so to speak, of, of failure in, in, in businesses. I, I completely agree, folks. Uh, the, you know, one, one really good way to kind of understand the, the first piece that Jeff was alluding to is like a feasibility analysis. Really mm -hmm. kind of, I'm doing that now with an educational conference, uh, trying to determine, okay, if we have it, let me look at all the different locations we can possibly have it. And then what are the, what is the cost of those locations? And then what is the average cost uh, individuals will be willing to pay for a CME credit to attend a conference? And then mm -hmm. is it even feasible? Will I be able to make money? And, and then if, if so, how many people can I have attend? But then I also have to understand what's the capacity of their room that we're going to be renting. So there's a lot of different things that kind of go into the feasibility analysis, but it's really good to understand that piece. Uh, and then getting out and just asking customers, truly uh, making sure you get outside of your inner circle is so important. Okay. Uh, mom is always going to love whatever you do, right? Uh, and so getting out to people uh, that, that know your product, because that will help you on that second piece that Jeff was um, talking about. And that is really kind of creating your ideal customer profile, mm -hmm. right? Understanding who really is your customer and, and then really create from there. Once you've, once you've found a problem and you found your ideal customer profile, okay, now create a minimal viable product, an MVP, uh, and then take that to them and see see what what's good and what's not. Then you can kind of you know pivot and create some adjustments from there. But it's much much easier to to fail that way than it is to go out and buy a product and like have fifteen hundred units and then you go out to a trade show and nobody buys it, right? That's right. Uh, and then now and you're I have sitting, seen, yeah. now you're just sitting on bricks. I've seen multiple people more practically and, and sometimes literally mortgage their homes to, to get their business off the ground. And they just didn't do the work. They just didn't do the work. So couldn't agree with you more. You know, we, we use the Venn diagram of, of technical feasibility, which virtually anything's technically feasible desirability in terms of how big is the problem and do it. Is it a big enough problem to enough people? And then business viability. Can we, can we create the product or solution and get it to the market in, in a, in a profitable way and deliver yeah. it in a profitable way. And, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, folks, there are other individuals that are willing to be your mentor to help support you. And, and, and as Jeff mentioned, uh, it's not going to them and saying, Hey, can you be your mentor? Can I be your mentor? It's, it's really saying, Hey, can I take you out to coffee? As Jeff mentioned, can I take you out to lunch? Uh, can I, can we chat over a beer, right? Yeah. Uh, sure. I'll pitch in pints. I'll give you a drink, a pitch, uh, drink, a drink, a, you know, some beer and we'll do a pitch real quick. Uh, but really it's, it's just kind of getting in front of people and being in their community uh, because the best way to understand the issues that anyone is having is actually to walk in their shoes. And that's, that means right. getting in their community, being involved, understanding, what what they're going through, what their makeup is, uh, and that's going to go a long way. Now, now you know, there's a lot of yeah, we've kind of mentioned it. There's a lot of difficulties in entrepreneurship, and there's uh, creating a small business. What would you say has been one of your your most difficult moments uh, building your business? You know, I would say that um, I and I, I fall into the trap that many, many entrepreneurs and small business owners fall into is uh, not doing a good enough job of 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 handing off tasks to people. 
Um, you know, and, and I'm, I mean, I, I teach people how to, how to do that, how to, how to, uh, time track where they're spending their time to, to place value on the activities relative to their end result, uh, to, to figure out what are the ones that they need to hand off and how do they source people to hand those off to. So I teach people how to do that. I have a process for how to do that. And I still myself <laughs> find myself doing, you know, not operating at the top of my license to use some medical terminology there. Right. You know, do you as don't I wanna, say, not as I do. Kind yeah. Of you, yeah. You don't want to have a physician doing, uh, doing a lot of menial, uh, uh, tasks. They shouldn't be above it, but you want them operating at the top of their license. It's the same thing with an RN operating at the top of their license. And you use a patient care tech to check the vital signs, to change the beds, to do some of those kinds of things. So, you know, it, it really just, um, that's, that's the biggest thing that I've struggled with. And, and, and I, you know, I'm constantly on, uh, on guard to make sure that I'm not doing that. You know, and I, I like you saying that, and I like you using the actual healthcare kind of medical provider, uh, example. I think there's a misconception, especially in the healthcare industry in particular, where in order for you to be the CEO or the president of a healthcare institution, you have to be a medical provider. Um, I would actually argue that you should have a dyad system because Jeff was Mm -hmm. mentioning, uh, I want my surgeon, if if you're going to be a surgeon, I want my surgeon to be focusing on kind of surgery 100% of the time, not 50%. What what gets the hat worn most? Is it the CEO hat? Is it the the medical doctor hat? Um, Having a dyad, you know, having a business partner, a someone with an MBA as someone, you know, they have a chief uh, operating officer, someone that has that business security, uh, educational, uh, you know, insight to help scale the business is so important. I think are seeing a lot of these healthcare systems, unfortunately, um, kind of flounder a little bit because of the pandemic and a lot of other things. Yep. But a lot of them is because they haven't thought about scaling before. Uh, and, and scaling does, in fact, support patient care. Yeah, you know, and, and I find a lot of times for companies that are raising money, you know, if if you're the visionary founder and, and you're kind of the prototypical CEO and, and you've got an idea for a, a technology-driven product, I, one of the failures that I have seen is those visionary founders thinking that they can manage the, the technology development without a CTO and they'll do it with an offshore person that they got off of Upwork. Now I've, I've used plenty of people off of Upwork and it's, there's some great resources out there, but I also see them pay about five X what they should have paid for to get a working product out there um, because they didn't put someone who over the target, who was actually an expert in technology development. And so because they were hoarding the equity and didn't want to bring someone in and give them a little bit of equity. Now, by the same token, I've seen, someone who was an engineer and a CTO by, by design insists that he continue being the CEO. And, uh, and he went and tried to raise some money. And I just, I just had to pull him aside and say, look, man, we're not going to give you any money. If you're going to be the CEO of the company, you are the chief scientific officer or the chief technology officer. And you're a great one at that. You really need to go hire a business officer to 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 be the CEO or the COO or something and let them take the lead on your fundraising pitches. Um and they did and we invested and and you know and so um you know it's it's very difficult for some founders to 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 give up a little bit of equity in exchange for the right talent around them. And it's that's a big mistake in my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think when you're small, you know, smaller uh, business, you know, just kind of starting out, it makes sense to be the jack of all trade, master of none. You do wear multiple hats. Uh, but as you, as Jeff mentioned, once you begin to scale and you have those conversations where you're, where you're starting to kind of go into that next echelon of business, you're going to have to bring in, you know, individuals uh, that are, that can help support your core competencies. Uh, they're, they're just areas we're not good at. Trust me, my wife tells me there's a lot of things I'm not good at on a daily basis, you know, yep. so so making yep. sure that we just have someone that can be to again, going back to that, the results versus um, relationships, you know, that pendulum, making sure that everything's getting supported on both sides. So it's an even balance sure. uh, is, is really important. And really like, I, I think that's it's very true. Now, you know, what what has you been doing this obviously quite some time? What have you said has been one of the most enjoyable pieces of entrepreneurship mm-hmm. to you? You know, I just, I love someone walking into my office and they're a bit perplexed and I love them 
walking out with a little bit of a kick in, a, in their step and a twinkle in their eye because they've got <laughs> something of value. So our brand promise here at the Conductor Startup Junkie is results-driven insights, tools, and connections. So that's what we want our clients to expect and experience from the contact with us is number one, when we sit down and have the conversation, we're going to be results driven and we're going to put the, we're going to connect them with, with either ins new insights, new tools, or new connections to help them move their business forward. And so by just keeping that brand promise on the forefront of our mind, you know, most of my coaching meetings are 30 minutes in length. And I used to do an hour and we would spend 30 minutes just kind of shooting the breeze. And I found out that I could do twice as many coaching meetings if I did them in 30 minute increments and we spend three minutes kind of breaking the ice. And then we spend 27 minutes getting down to business and, uh, and, and it works beautifully. And so that's one of the most fun things that I've seen. Um, seeing, you know, I, I say that, that the, I, I'm on the local economic development board, which traditional economic development is very competitive. It's about recruiting employers into your geography. And when they choose your geography, they choose to forego someone else's geography. So it's a very competitive process. Entrepreneurship is is not competitive at all. It's it's what I call economic empowerment. It's creating a dollar where a dollar didn't exist. Someone has an idea and you help them bring that idea to fruition. And then in the first year, they hire five people. By the way, the average new startup creates 4.74 jobs in their first year in business. Uh, they invest 67 cents of, of every dollar they take in back into the local economy. And so helping someone take an idea and turn that into a viable business for them that transforms their life and the lives of their children. I, it can't be matched. Can't be matched. Yeah. And I, I really like your uh, bringing up the statistics uh, of these small businesses that scale and, and bring up, you know, a little bit over 4.5, you mentioned or uh, employees on an annual basis. That's really important. And also, you know, it's, it's okay to, as you mentioned, it's okay to fail. Now, what, what advice would you have or an aspiring entrepreneur that might be listening right now? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I see a lot of times is an aspiring entrepreneur will have an idea, but they don't want to tell anybody about it because they're afraid that somebody's going to steal it. Oh man, and all so, the time. All and the so time. they want me to sign an NDA. And I say, look, if, if I signed an NDA for every coaching meeting I had, I would never do any coaching. And I would always, and I'd be broke because I'd be paying lawyers to review the NDAs. You know, uh, but the, the, the advice that I have is to, to understand that 15% of anybody's success is about the idea. 85% is about the execution of the idea. So go find the local entrepreneurial support organization in your community. It might be an SBDC, which is a small business development center, usually at a college in Arkansas. They're called a small business and technology development center, an SBDTDC. Uh, it could be a SCORE chapter, uh, the uh, of uh, retired executives, uh, service core of retired executives, that's SCORE. They're usually in partnership with a chamber, or it may be an incubator or an accelerator in your, org in your community. So do some research and go find every single one of those and then go sit down with them if you're an aspiring entrepreneur. Uh, don't go hire the creation of a business plan off of the internet. I've had people go do that and pay $1,000 to get a business plan and they plop down a beautifully spiral bound document and plop it down on my table and I ask them what's in it and they can't tell me. Uh, go get, pick up a copy of two books that I would guide you to. One is Running Lean by Ash Marya. Running Lean by Ash Marya. And actually complete his lean canvas. His lean canvas is a nine box, one page business plan. And you can actually uh, YouTube search lean canvas in 20 minutes. And you'll see a, a, a video, a 20 minute video of Ash actually creating a lean canvas in real time. So you can hit play and pause and create yours while he's creating his, and then pick up a second copy of a booklet called, uh, talking to humans by gift constable. It's an 80 page booklet that has pretty much become the Bible on doing customer discovery. Go get those books and do what those books tell you if you can't find an entrepreneurial support organization nearby. And even if you can, start there. It's going to cost you about $20 maximum uh, to get both of those books and uh, complete the first or second version of your Lean Canvas and then go sit down with an entrepreneurial support organization representative. I love it. I love it. And because at the end of the day, those two things 
are like the core of, I think, starting any business. So one, getting some education, right? And then two, networking. Get out there and network. Get out there and uh, talk with right. other people. And I like your ideas. Stop pretending that, stop trying to hoard your idea. Trust me, somebody else probably has that same idea out there. But as Jeff mentioned, it's it's about the execution of the idea. Um, there, there are several car makers out there, right? They're all successful. Some are better than others. Uh, but it's it's basically how do you create your brand? How do you how do you market it? How do you really create a customer relationship so those those individuals feel not just as a customer of being aware of your product, but being a loyal consumer where they're now sharing your product or designs or information on social media, because that's really how you begin to kind of grow. Now, Jeff, for folks that are interested, you, you have a lot of advice, you, you're doing a lot, folks that might want to learn more about you, you might want to connect with you. How do they do that? Where do they find you online? So can find me in a couple of places. One is I'm very active on LinkedIn and it's basically LinkedIn and it's Jeff Standridge. Um, uh, Jeff S at innovationjunkie.com is, is a great way to connect with me uh, or um, jeffstandridge.com. Perfect. And again, folks, if you forget all of that information, you can subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter by visiting the shades of e.com. You can also subscribe to all of the social channels. We are at the Shades of E. And you can also, if you feel so willingly, become a Patreon member for $5 a month. You can actually help support the podcast and that can continue to bring on phenomenal guests like Jeff uh, to share their inspirational stories and really provide some insight and education to uh, hopefully help you succeed in your entrepreneurial endeavor. Now, Jeff, is there any last words you have before we leave? You know, I would be pleased and honored to speak with any of your listeners. If they have any questions or want to connect, uh, be glad to see them on LinkedIn and, and uh, uh, encourage them to reach out. You hear that, folks? Jeff on LinkedIn. I'll, again, I'll have that information on the link, uh, the newsletter as well as the blog post. So please visit theshadesofe.com. Thank you and have a great night.